What's up, Kings fans? Welcome back to Trade and Jabs NHL Edition. Joining me is senior NHL writer for ESPN and co-host of the Puck Soup podcast, Greg Wyshynski. Wish, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's uh, finally good to chat with you face to face. I feel like I've written about you uh, for the better part of my life. Uh, so it's a good, <laughs> it's good to chat with you finally. Um, and good to chat with you also at a time when talking about things that are LA Kings or LA Kings of Jason isn't painful. Uh, this was yes. one of the more pleasant surprises of the season so far is the fact that all the California teams uh, that I think we were, uh, you know, shoveling dirt on last season uh, have uh, risen from the grave as it were to be relevant again. Oh, absolutely. And that's something that I wanted to dig right into. You know, the Kings have won seven of eight. Uh, they're on an eight game point streak. Um, you know, the last three, four years haven't gone the way that, you know, people had hoped, but this year has definitely uh, been, a, you know, flipped around, which is great to see. Uh, and one of the, the words that's kind of, you know, going around the Kings organization is identity. You know, what is that Kings identity? And, you know, we've been asking players, you know, Todd McClellan, you know, what do you think the Kings identity has to be for them to continue to stay in the playoff race? Well, it's, there's a couple of different answers to that, which is what it should be and then what it is. And what it should be is, this incredible confluence that GM Rob Blake's been waiting for of the veteran players and the young players all kind of converging at the same time. And it's funny because like you could make the argument that the Anaheim Ducks are actually doing it better right now in the sense of like Zegras and Drysdale and, and the way that those guys have played around the veteran players. Troy Terry, I think is probably also in that young groups still too, even though he's yep. a little bit older than the other two. Um, they've had that confluence too. And, and, you know, the Kings have obviously been waiting for years and, and to have, to start to see the Kaliyevs move into the lineup and, and to know that, you know, eventually Botfield will be there and eventually Turcotte will be there. I think that to me has always been the identity of the team is that you still have some of the old guard and it breaks my heart that Dowdy got hurt. I want him to come back and, and be great as he was in, uh, briefly. Um, and then you have this whole next generation coming up and to connect those two would be fantastic. What their identity is, is, is I think a team that is well out kicking its coverage with its goaltending so far. Um, yeah. If you look under the hood of the LA Kings, defensively, as far as expected goals and, and some of the other metrics, not the best, um, but real good in the save percentage. I think their five and five save percentage this season is, is if not second overall in the, in the top three or four in the league right now. And I think it's one of the reasons why they've been able to come over some of the defensive deficiencies that they've had. Um, so I think you probably want to see, and this could be a byproduct again of having younger players in the lineup. You want to see a better overall team defense in front of the goaltending. Um, but, uh, but you can't, you can't argue with the results so far. I mean, we can look under the hood all we want, but you can, rather probably look at the standings and say things are going pretty well yeah absolutely you know cal peterson is is played well and then jonathan quick is is back to his you know 2012 2014 you know self as of right now um but you mentioned you know the vets and then you mentioned the the uh the young guys and the the kalievs and you know bjorn foots and mikey anderson's who are playing really well as as young players but you know that middle ground is something that the kings have have lacked in terms of depth scoring. You know, it's it's no question and and you know no secret that uh, that they haven't had that in the last few years. But one of the major reasons that they're off to, to the start they are at at eight five and two and and on that point streak is that secondary scoring is starting to really flourish. You know, you've got guys like Philip Deneau who's got nine points in his last nine games, also with a fifty seven point seven save percentage on the season. I have followed nine points in his last nine. You know, Kempe eight in his last nine, you know, in that middle tier, that secondary scoring, maybe not those young guys, but those guys that are right, you know, you know, right into the, they've had the experience, but they haven't totally breaking, broken out. You know, who do you think is maybe that most important piece in that middle tier? Well, I follow has always been one of my favorite guys uh, on the team. I think that he uh, plays the sort of straight ahead game that you like to see from a player that plays uh, usually up with the skill guys, but you know, the, the no signing was interesting because I felt like in a lot of ways it was maligned by people that didn't necessarily think that me, he was maybe worth that contract, which to me sort of undermined what he was able to do with the Montreal Canadiens 
Um, I think it probably gave a little bit too much weight to his line mates versus what he was able to do in that role as their kind of de facto number one center. Um, but I also really like that kind of signing. Like, even if the argument was that the Kings weren't in a position yet where they needed a Philip Deneau in their lineup, you know, it's been a trend in the league for a few years now, and it may have even started when the Rangers got Panarin because the argument for paying Panarin wasn't that Panarin was going to have a transformative effect in their lineup, although that's how it kind of worked out. It was that yeah. when the Rangers were through this rebuild and were ready to turn the corner, there might not be a Panarin available. You saw it with the Devils and Dougie Hamilton. You know, they're, they're playing well and he's been a part of it. But the, the, the notion was everybody on that team is really young. And why do you need Dougie Hamilton now? And the answer was, well, because when we get to where we think we're going, he might not be there. And it's the same thing with the no. Like if you have the ability to get a really good two-way center like that and, and put him in your lineup and know that it's going to make a difference from a depth perspective when, you know, you have, you have Kopitar, when hopefully Byfield ascends to being, you know, for lack of a better comparison, the Malkin to Kopitar's Crosby at some point, or vice versa, uh, then then you want to have that third guy in the in in the pecking order to fill out your lineup in an effective way. And if you don't think that a Philip Deneau is going to be there when you need him, get him now. Like who cares? That's why you hand out term. Yeah, well, they had you know they had the money at the time. Obviously, the Kings uh, have so many young players, so they have the ability to. Uh, to make that signing and one of the big you know things that's been talked about with the Deneau signing is how much it's freed on say Kopitar up to be able to just you know take the face off in the offensive zone and let Deneau handle that defensive side you know what have you seen in Andre Kopitar this season now that he's got that number two guy that can kind of take a little bit of the weight off of his shoulders I mean he's a pretty he's pretty much a model of consistency isn't he outside of a couple of years where we're like what's wrong with Andre Kopitar I mean his, his yeah. scoring has always kind of been there um, so I'm not really surprised to see him streak out of the gate. Like he has, I, I think he's always been, you know, a player that you could count on. I do find it interesting though, uh, just to, to drill down on Kopitar for a second. I was doing a lot of like hall of fame writing recently because of, okay. well, the hall of fame happening. And, uh, and it's, it's really interesting to see. I mean, if you go back for the entirety of his career and really take a look at it, I mean, rare are the centers that are ahead of him in the scoring race. And I, and I think that we've talked a lot about Drew Doughty with regard to the Hall of Fame. And I think that like, that's because Drew Doughty talks about it and is like, I want to make sure I can get in. I don't want to be the guy remembered as being the guy who faded away. But I mean, there's not whole, been a whole hell of a lot of talk about Kopitar as a Hall of Famer. And I think that, you know, if you're somebody who looks at, say, Nick Backstrom and says that should be a Hall of Famer. Um, I think Kopitar is right there with Backstrom. He's right there with Bergeron. He's right there in that class of elite two-way centers that we had for the last 15 years. And, and you know, maybe it's because other players just suck up all the air out of the room. And, and maybe it's because Anje isn't necessarily his best hype man. But I, I found it interesting in sort of thinking about the guys that are, you know, maybe four or five years away from, from retirement um, or, or at least from falling off a statistical cliff. And then thinking about Kopitar in that uh, in that regard and thinking, wow, you know, this guy's got a legit case to be a, to be a Hall of Famer one day. He's he's you're right. He's not the, the biggest hype man of himself. He's obviously a very <laughs> humble player and yes. not one who you know talks about it. Maybe like Drew Doughty does. But, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons that, you know, that might not be a conversation starter it, is, you know, you've lived on the East Coast and the West Coast. Do you think the, the East Coast bias with the Kings playing so late at night and uh, a guy who's, you know, very quiet, just goes about his business and does his job, do you think that might, you know, fall into the, to the reasoning on why Kopitar isn't talked about as much as he should be? I think it's possible, but I also think that, like, you know, for a lot of, I mean, let's face it, like, of, of the centers we talked about, you know, Backstrom gets mentioned as being the most underrated guy in the league, and he lives in, in Ovechkin's shadow. Bergeron gets hyped up as the best two-way center in the league because he's Bergeron, and he wins yep. Selkie trophies and, and is on. I think the streak he's on now is like no one's been nominated more consecutive years for an NHL award than, Kopitar, than, uh, than Bergeron, which is an incredible stat. And then the other one's probably Taves. And, yeah. and, you know, 
until recently when we all decided we weren't going to talk about the Blackhawks anymore. Uh, <laughs> he was definitely put on a pedestal of being one of the best two-way centers of all time. And, and it was placed on that 100 best players list by the NHL, although I don't think he belonged there. And so you have these guys that are on this pedestal. And you're right. They're all sort of from the middle of the country over to the right. Uh, in Tave's case... There's obviously the Team Canada thing and obviously the multiple cups thing. And that's what makes me curious about Kopitar. Like, why isn't he more in that conversation? Because he was such an integral part of the championship teams the Kings had. And I mean, if you're talking about international play, like he was Slovenia that one year in the Olympics when they were yeah. like at least competitive. And the only thing I can figure is this. And, and this is why the Kings getting back to relevancy is the best thing that could happen to him is that they fell off a cliff, right? They, the Kings yeah. disappeared. They were bad. They were retooling. They were rebuilding. Rob Blake's plan was not to pepper the lineup with veteran players to make the team competitive. He just, he didn't want to like clog the, the pipes uh, that were going to bring forward these young players. And because of that choice, the Kings were terrible for a few years. And so I think much like how people forgot about Dowdy and much like how people forgot about Quick, not only because of the fate of the team, but because of his own play, uh, I think people forgot about Kopitar. And so this resurgence that the Kings are having is probably the best thing for his overall cachet as a star player in this league. Uh, absolutely. You know, it'll be an interesting conversation or at least topic to watch as the Kings continue to, to make their way through this season with uh, Kopitar's effectiveness and, and what he can do offensively. But, uh, you know, for the, the sake of this next question, I'm going to refer to you as, you know, our fashion forward jersey expert. <laughs> Um, you know, weekly you have a Jersey foul, uh, section in your blog, you know, it's something that you've done for, for years now. Uh, the LA Kings are coming out with their authentic Audi zero prime green, uh, alternative, alternate jerseys, uh, tomorrow or uh, later today on, uh, on Wednesday against the Washington Capitals. Uh, it's something that, uh, they've gone back to their nineties roots, uh, along with uh, a combination of their Chrome helmets from the 2020 stadium series uh at the air force academy uh i'm hoping this one doesn't fall into your jersey fouls category but what do you think of the jerseys i think they're pretty sweet i'm a huge fan of that logo and that could be nostalgia bias because that's the logo that i grew up with i mean i grew up in the gretzky years i have nothing but i i own a, a gretzky uh style jersey like i i have nothing but affinity for that logo i think of the logos that they've had um in the last like 25 years that's my favorite one no disrespect to the weird pencil point thing that they've been working with for a little bit. Um, so I'm really happy that it came back in vogue. In fact, the uh, reverse retro jersey that they had, um, which incorporated the uh, forum blue, do we call it, and, uh, and gold, uh, is, was one of my favorites from that line. So this jersey automatically scores points with me for reappropriating that logo. But I got to say, the thing I'm most excited about, and you mentioned it in, in your setup, I was at that stadium series game in, in Air Force, and it's memorable uh, for two reasons for me. One, I definitely had COVID. There's no absolutely no question that I thought what was at the time me struggling to climb stairs uh, at that altitude was in fact COVID because I also could not taste or smell anything. Uh, not a very good time for your boy. And it was pre-pandemic, like, you know, knowledge of things. Yeah, well. that was February. I was living in California at the time, and I remember distinctly. I remember one, my lungs, my lungs being wrecked when I when I uh, went to Air Force, and it might have been like after it. But then the thing that happened before is I, I the the smell taste thing happened. I remember this distinctly when around the time I had to get my wisdom teeth out, which thank God happened before everything shut down because that would have been a real oh. show. Um, and I remember telling the dentist doing the oral surgery, I'm like is the fact I can't taste anything related to these wisdom teeth. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, what, what is this? He's like, cause I can't really smell or taste anything. And uh, oh I was reading my. about it online and I, and I, it could be some sort of a, a, a glitch in my brain. Is it related to these? He's like, I don't, I've never heard of this before. So this was like before we knew anything about anything. So anyway, oh, that's yeah. one thing. The second thing was the helmets. I love the helmets. I think they're so cool. I remember them walking out of the locker room towards the ice uh, with the sun bouncing off the helmets and it they looked like centurions. They looked like they were going to battle. Like it was so cool, uh, those helmets. And so to incorporate that as part of the overall kit with a, a pretty good looking jersey to me is a huge win for the Kings. 
That's awesome. Well, I, I can't wait to see them now that they've gonna, they'll have the, uh, the New Jersey's with them. It'll be interesting to see how they, they turn out, but I know there's a lot of excitement around the, the organization and, uh, I think we're all ready to see those later today. Um, you know, going back to these Jersey fouls, uh, you're very vocal about what you do and don't like. I want to know your, your top three rules for what is a Jersey foul. And maybe if you have any on the top of your head that you just are, live with in terms of the three jerseys that you just couldn't stand in seeing those? Well, there's a few. Um, first of all, don't put your own name on the back of the jersey. Um, the only way that you can have your name on the back of the jersey is if someone, if you played, obviously, uh, but also if the team gives it to you. And that happens very frequently. Like you are a season ticket holder and the team is like, thank you for spending thousands of dollars to see the Florida Panthers all these years. And here's your name on the back of a jersey. That's fine. That makes you a de facto part of the team. Okay. Um, don't wear the jersey uh, that a player did not wear. Okay. Now, by that, I mean, like, if you are someone who is a big, uh, let's say, a Drew Downey fan, right? And you go back into the 1980s and you get, somehow you get one of those jerseys uh. and you put Drew Downey's name on that jersey. Well, he never wore that jersey. Now, the exception to that rule is if the player is retired, in which case his, uh, I mean, if his number is retired, rather, in which case his number is out of circulation, can never be worn again, hangs in the rafters. You can then wear that player's name and number on the back of any jersey that's ever in circulation because no one else could ever have it. It's it's his number. It's that not that name and number in perpetuity throughout all the timelines is is fine to wear on whatever style jersey you want, be it uh, outdoor, indoor, whatever. Um, but the third thing is that look, I, we all know it's very funny, but. There's absolutely no humor to be mined by putting 69 in your jersey anymore. Absolutely none. There's none. It's done. It's over. If a player wants to do it in the NHL, that's funny. We've not gotten to, to, to like saturation point of actual players wearing 69. So they can do that. But you, guy with the jersey and, and, and amazing amount of disposable income to put whatever you want in the back of it, you don't have to do it. Um, there's other funny numbers to pick. I, I'm a big fan of the trend we've seen in recent years of the 420 jersey, for example. When I lived in San Jose, a lot of those in circulation in San Jose. But this other one, we're done. We don't need to do it anymore. Uh, yeah, I love it. Um, the last thing here is, you know, you started covering the NHL in 2006. Uh, the Kings have obviously been through two Stanley Cups, you know, a few runs to the, to the conference finals. You know, you've covered the team, you know, just in broad, you know, what is maybe your favorite story that you've written or covered on the LA <laughs> Kings in your time? Well, I mean, it's obviously the time when I uh, doubted their ability to come back from a three nothing hole against the San Jose Sharks, uh, made a public bet that uh, they wouldn't. Uh, and then uh, for having then lost that bet because the Sharks are the Sharks in the playoffs, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I took uh, several pies to the face on the ice uh, during intermission of an LA Kings playoff game. Uh, I was pied in the face by Will Wheaton. I was pied in the face by Bailey. I was pied in the face by a number of announcers. And uh, I mean, as far as like, you know, career highlights uh, for me, uh, getting John Scott in the All-Star game, doing tequila shots with Tim Peel, getting uh, a pie on the face from Will Wheaton at center ice at the, an LA Kings uh, playoff game for picking against the Kings in a playoff series was probably right up there. And uh, there you can find the images online. Uh, they, they are actually there. I think the only images of me on Getty images, the wire service is me getting a pie in the face <laughs> while wearing a shark's t-shirt at center ice. Um, so it is, uh, it was amazing. And, and my favorite part of that story, by the way, is that um, they, the pies were legit like they were in metal containers, like metal trays. Uh -huh. So like whoever, and I think it was Wheaton, whoever threw it the hardest at me actually sliced the bridge of my nose with the pie tin. So at the end of this, you know, ridiculousness at center ice, where I'm now like covered in, in pie, pho, you know, cream and, and all other manner and sort of stuff. I'm also like, bloody like a crimson mask is forming on my face <laughs> it's like blood, blood and pie and uh, <laughs> and that i think was the last time i ever picked the sharks in a playoff series if memory serves well you learned your lesson uh hopefully 
<laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, hopefully uh, you'll bet against them and we'll get some more pies in your face uh, this coming year <laughs> if you uh, don't like the Kings in the playoffs. But uh, Greg Wyshynski, senior NHL writer for ESPN and co-host of the Puck Soup podcast. Thanks for joining Trade and Jabs, and uh, it's been great to talk to you. My honor and pleasure, sir, and continued success.